The Gallian Foundation fosters, recognizes, and rewards excellence in scientific innovation to improve the human condition. André Malraux said once in one of his novels, Une vie humaine ne vaut rien, mais rien ne vaut une vie humaine. Human life is worth nothing, but nothing is worth a human life. All these men and women are trying to save human lives. Is there anything more noble than that? Around the globe, the Prix Galleon is considered as the equivalent of the Nobel Prize for the industry mobilizing an unrivaled network of Nobel laureates and top biomedical scientists. The Galleon Foundation manages an independent, cross-functional and geographically diverse program of events and sponsorship to brand the best of the best in new medicines and diagnostics. The Prix Galleon is a welcome initiative to stimulate creative research and promote excellence. Barack Obama. The Galleon Awards Ceremony is considered the equivalent of the Oscars night for the innovators in the labs and awards every year the best pharmaceutical product, the best biotechnology product, the best medical technology, and the best digital health product. The Roy Vagelos Pro Bono Humanum Award for Global Health Equity is bestowed to an individual, a company, an academic institution or a non-governmental agency that has helped to improve the human condition through the application of biopharmaceutical science to problems of developing or underserved populations worldwide. This is the right event on the right issue at the right time. I thank His Excellency, the President for bringing Prix Galleon to Africa and I look forward to the day when we will celebrate an African winner of the Prix Galleon. I'm particularly grateful to receive this award. The awards are among the highest honors in science and commerce because they lead to improvement in the human condition. The Prix Galleon Awards recognize the world's brightest minds and most innovative companies. They are a true celebration of the hard work required to produce life-changing interventions. That is what makes us optimistic about the future. Congratulations to all of you. Make a difference. Join the Galleon Foundation. Welcome panelists and audience on behalf of the Galleon Foundation and the Global Virus Network. I am Kenneth Mock, a serial biotech entrepreneur and senior advisor to the chairman of the Center for Global Health Innovation and the Global Health Crisis Coordination Center. I am truly delighted to serve as the moderator for today's webinar, building the post COVID toolkit. What should we be doing now to prepare for the next pandemic? This webinar is part of a series of webinars hosted by the Galleon Foundation and the Global Virus Network to explore the intersection of ethics, economics, science, and healthcare. In the lead up to the October 28th, 2021 Galleon Forum in New York and the November 10th through 11th, 2021 Jerusalem Ethics Forum. Galleon is also hosting webinars focused on digital health, disease specific issues, and Africa's growing role in medical innovation in support of the foundation's mission to catalyze innovation to improve the human condition. We are all pleased to be part of this noble effort. So while the world is still reeling from COVID-19, it is not too soon to think about the lessons learned from this as well as prior epidemics and pandemics in order to hopefully prevent and or better deal with future infectious crises. It is true that many entities within the public and private sectors mobilized to successfully accelerate development and delivery of the COVID-19 vaccine, but certainly this response was not universal. And to date, I think it's fair to state that the extraordinary scientific success was not and still is not a guarantee of societal success. For those of you who joined the Galleon webinar this past March 24th, we explored the question of how ethical and economic forces 
are impacting actions by industry and government, particularly as leaders consider the concern that none of us will be safe until everyone is safe. Now, as we watch the course of COVID-19 and particularly the ebb and flow of variants, we can view this concern in all its reality. And this sets up the foundational question for today's webinar. What should we be doing now to better prepare for the next pandemic? What lessons should we take away from COVID, from the COVID-19 experiences and the epidemics and pandemics that were fought, fought before COVID? What steps should we be taking? What tools, policies, and practices should we be preparing to better position ourselves to respond to pandemics and other disease outbreaks? So yes, science delivered at unprecedented speed, but how can we improve in the future? Or better posed for today's webinar, how do we ensure that we do better in the future? How do we make past missteps into future learning experiences? How do we translate the learning experiences from the successes as well as the failures into global equity in the future? And how do we best make sure we don't make the same mistakes in future pandemics and epidemics? I think it is important to state upfront that if we are blunt and honest with each other, there will be questions raised and statements made that can be viewed through the lens of valuable feedback, of meaningful learning experiences, and of honest critique, but many of these might be painful and difficult to talk about. But if we are not honest in our evaluations, we run the risk of repeating mistakes and leaving unresolved complexities that can and should be addressed now. Well, before turning to the questions and to our panelists, we would like to frame the conversation with a question to you, the audience, that is now coming up on the Zoom screen. We realize that these are very um, complex questions in a way, and they simplify, they are very much simplified. But uh, these three buckets will provide a perspective as we begin and as we end our discussion today. Please select your answer and then we will share the results at the end of the webinar. And you can click the button in the uh, little square box to make it larger for those of you with a bad eyesight like me. So let's just spend a few seconds reading the questions and providing your answers. All right, um, these questions are all components of today's timely topic, which we will dive into immediately after a brief introduction from each of our panelists. And I should start by saying that unfortunately, Elliot Levy um, had a family medical uh, emergency and is unable to join us today, um, but we are truly delighted to have uh, the panelists who are with us. Um, and we'd like to start with an introduction by Dr. Christian Brechot, um, who is the president of the Global Virus Network. Thank you. Thank you very much for this introduction. And really, I'm very grateful to the Gallia Foundation for this partnership with uh, the uh, Global Virus Network I'm the uh, president of. And uh, well, I would say that uh, following up on your excellent introduction, uh, it's really about how do we translate better to the population, to the world, the huge progress in technology, in science overall, in medicine and in public health. It's really what, what is really at stake for the future and which are the best mechanisms. So I don't want to take time in this uh, first uh, uh, statement, but just to your point, I mean, we, we, we are all of us uh, speaking about coordination, about partnerships between academic and private sector and with governments and uh, of reactivity. Uh, the, the point is really to find, to delineate the best mechanisms that we can identify to do so. And this is, I guess, what will be the conversation about. But I, I would just like to point out that we also need to build on what has been achieved. And uh, I'm sure that uh, my colleagues, who, uh, I mean, uh, they are experts. But you see, starting from HIV and then from the Ebola crisis and uh, so many crises, we have had 
uh, a significant progress in, the, in global public health with a, a number of uh, uh, institutions, obviously WHO, uh, with the uh, so-called GOARN, this network, with the international health regulation, with uh, the uh, GAVI for the vaccine, more recently the CEPI. And uh, I believe that we really have to, to think as to how to provide power to these organizations, power about against only national interests. That's really what is at stake. And it's a very complicated topic, but this is what is at stake. The second point is really to have a science driven strategy, which is very easy to tell, which may seem mundane, but which is really the point. And to have independent institutions and novel modes of organization. And we will come back to this and I will also say a few words regarding the, the global virus network. So I will stop there, Ken, for this uh, few points. But I really believe that we, we need to provide power to the coordination mechanisms. And that's a very complicated issue. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, next, uh, Professor William Fahey, who is the Emeritus Presidential Distinguished Professor of International Health at the Rollins School of Public Health at Emory University and who has an extraordinarily broad background in this arena. Thank you, Ken. I've had a opportunity to work at the national level at CDC, at a state level, at a county level, with WHO, with UNICEF. And what we see with coronavirus is it combines tragedy and triumph. And that's what I hope we can talk about so that we see what actually did work and then try to understand how do we change what didn't work. So thank you. All right, and, and finally, um, uh, Dr. Marie Paulkini, Director of Research at INSERM and the Board Chair for the Drugs for Neglected Diseases Initiative. Thank you very much, a pleasure to be with you today. You know, I, I, what I see is that, uh, as Christian was saying, is that we have made progress also along these different crises. We have learned uh, some aspects of communication or how to share sequences when there was a crisis of, a, of avian flu. For those who remember, this was in, uh, uh, in the 2006 years. Then we have learned in, uh, in, uh, during the, the West African Ebola crisis that we needed absolutely to, um, to be a more forthcoming and to, to share scientific results real time so that uh, public health could be inspired by these results and that we could progress together. And all these has these experiences from the pre previous crisis have been applied in, 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 in the COVID crisis. And we've seen indeed that all these preprint have come out and, and all the scientists have been followed, following real time the progress of evidence and progress of science. Now, of course, we need to see also what we could make better in this crisis and make sure that these lessons learned as where the lessons learned of Ebola applied in, in, uh, in COVID, how they can be applied for the next crisis. Thank you very much. Great, thank you all. So our format for today is based on the questions um, that I covered in the, um, in the forward looking issues a few moments ago. And, and this will be an interactive discussion and, and given their diverse backgrounds, we would like, like each panelist to give their perspective on these questions and have an open and, uh, and, and free flowing dialogue. Uh, towards the end of the webinar, we will incorporate some of the questions from the audience. So please ask your questions through the Q&A button on the Zoom platform and we will address them at the end, time permitting. So for the first question, uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Fahey who has the longest term perspective on responses to pandemics as a result of his extraordinary career and has held positions of leadership that have changed the course of past epidemics. The question broadly stated is this, we all know that COVID-19 is just the latest pathogen based global health crisis and not the only one in recent memory. Looking collectively at these infectious disease crises, including SARS, MERS, smallpox, and others. What can we learn from the responses of governments, of non-governmental organizations and agencies, 
and of the independent research and pharmace pharmaceutical community. What have you learned about the systems and responses during COVID-19 and these other situations that can influence the speed and the quality of future responses? What worked well, what didn't? Thank you, Ken, and thank you for your nice way of saying I'm the oldest person around. I didn't uh, say that. <laughs> the, um, the point you make about past outbreaks, uh, for the last 30 years, we've had on average one new infectious disease a year. And so we are learning new things as we go. But one of the interesting things is three quarters of those uh, new infections involve an animal host. And we've not yet learned at WHO and CDC how to actually combine human surveillance and animal surveillance. We do it on an ad hoc basis with each new problem. So that's one of the difficulties. I mentioned that this is really a story of triumph and tragedy. And I'll start with the, the tragedy part of this uh, because we made lots of mistakes. And I say we, because it's been said that when you have a problem like this, there are some people who are guilty, but everyone's responsible. And so uh, these, are, these are problems that uh, all of us are responsible for. And that is, since the time of Pasteur, we've been learning things that are important in infectious disease control. And in the United States, and I limit myself to, to looking at that, in the United States, we somehow ignored almost every one of those lessons. And it's just incredible in my mind that these lessons are so important and we ignore them. What am I talking about? Well, the first lesson is that this is a cause and effect world. And uh, Stephen Hawking in his book, A Short History of Time, says the whole history of science is the gradual realization that things do not happen in an arbitrary fashion. And so if you know the cause, then you have some chance of changing the effect. Instead, what happened in this country is we had a president who said, it's all magic, it'll disappear. Uh, one of his advisors, Dr. Atlas says, that uh, let nature take its course because herd immunity will, will stop this. And so there was not this appreciation of cause and effect. But the second lesson is you have to know the truth if you're going to do something about the problem. And sometimes it's so hard to accept the truth. And I remember back in October of 1973 in India when we tried a new approach to surveillance and in six days time we found 10,000 new cases of smallpox that no one knew about. And we were totally overwhelmed. And some people said, let's never do that again. Well, we needed to do it again because we needed to know uh, the truth. And during this coronavirus pandemic, we had trouble as Americans knowing what the truth was because the White House would say one thing and the scientists would say another thing and it seemed to change day to day. Uh, we've learned over the, the uh, decades that you need to form coalitions and that the best coalitions are the ones where everyone's agreeing to an endpoint. We did not have that. We know from the past that you have to have a national plan. And instead what we got was a order to the states, figure out what you're gonna do and compete with each other rather than have a national plan. We know from the past, these have to be global responses. And what happens? We have a president that draw, withdraws from WHO in the midst of this. So one uh, lesson after another simply ignored. And so we come up with another lesson, which is that lessons mean nothing if they're not heeded. And Mark Twain said, the person who doesn't read has no advantage over the person who can't read. Well, the nation that does not use these lessons from the past has no advantage over a nation that came before Louis Pasteur, before the germ theory. So the tragedies are real. But on the other side of that, here you have a vaccine developed that is so good. I mean, it is spectacular. And 
this virus that scared everybody is no match for the science. And it doesn't even matter whether you're talking about uh, messenger RNA or, or uh, even talking about protein vaccines, the science is just superb. And so you asked yourself, how could the same people who inhibited public health measures have supported the development of the vaccine? And I don't know, but I think it could be as simple as it's very easy to make public health pronouncements such as this will disappear by magic, but very few people think they can make a vaccine. And so they're willing to give money to the vaccine producers and NIH and you know, to get out of the way. So even with a spectacular vaccine, my last point on this, even with a spectacular vaccine and a National Academy of Science study on allocation of the vaccine, even with that, we continue to make mistakes because the administration was uh, hurt by the implications that they were not rolling out the vaccine fast enough. And so they forgot all of the allocation rules and just said, anyone over 65 is in the first group. Well, they did increase the demand, but at the expense of a lot of workers younger than that, who actually needed the vaccine for protection for what they were doing every day. And once you say that, that over 65, you're in a priority group, you can't take it back. And so this really did hinder the way we used the vaccine at the beginning. And now we have, of course, that same problem with not giving enough vaccine to the rest of the world and somehow uh, thinking that that's okay. Let me, before we move on to Marie Paul, I'd just like to um, add one thing. You mentioned um, national plan and um, my impression was that, and I think I read something that was the national plan for a pandemic and for a major event, uh, but a lot was made that we didn't have a plan. So from your perspective, were the plans in existence both nationally and, and, um, and globally, or at least internationally, that were sufficient had they been followed or were there simply not sufficient plans? Two different ways of looking at the question. Sure, and plans are never sufficient, but we would have been much better off if we had followed the plans. I mean, the Obama administration actually made a, a White House office with, uh, with plans. And it reminded me of uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, we developed a plan for these sorts of things at CDC. And we had this with the FBI and secure phones and secure rooms and so forth, 24 hour uh, alerts that uh, people could respond to things. And the next director of CDC, when briefed on this said, well, that'll never happen. And he dismantled it overnight. And so when we had the anthrax problem uh, after 9-11, that no longer existed. So it's a problem when you don't use the plans even if they're inadequate. So we, sh we should have been able to start with those plans. All right, well, there's history repeating itself uh, in that sense. So uh, Marie Paul, um, love your thoughts. And also it may fit here and it may not about, there were some concerns that were mentioned during the prep sessions about your thoughts about sequence data sharing, but love your global perspective to start. Absolutely, thanks a lot for the question. Actually, looking at, you know, and the role of government, my impression that I had at that time is that there was much too much arrogance in decision makers because you know everybody thought you know what is a virus you know a virus we we can't let a virus derail the economy what counts is the economy this is what counts so when it started in China and it went so bad in China and. Uh, you know, nobody thought that if uh, President Jing took the risk of isolating completely Wuhan, where his goal is to get his people out of poverty, uh, in by all ways, then there was something really serious happening. And, you know, all, everybody was saying, ah, oh, you know, this in China is far away, never reverse, never come to us. And then when it started in Italy, 
then everybody said, oh, what's happening in Italy? Can you see this? Of course, you know, in France, in other places, our health system are much stronger. Never, ever will this happen to us. And, and when actually it, it, flow, it, fl it was just, Europe was just flown with, uh, with, uh, with COVID and with death and lack of oxygen, lack of mask, then suddenly decision making politicians realized that something was not right. And then they turned to the scientists and say, what do you think, what can you do? And then it took some time and it's good that they listen to the scientists, but also at the same time, what could understand also that actually the scientists should not make the politics. It's the politicians who have to, we hope that these positions, these decisions are inspired by science. And this is what, what Bill uh, Figge was saying had not happened in the US. So what we saw in other countries, indeed, that, that the, the scientists were listened to, were, but then, at one point, it even became too much. And then the citizens were starting to say, you know, who's making the politics and the policy in this country? Is it only the scientists and what's happening with the economy and all the rest? So I think that after a few, a few months of this crisis, we have reached in quite a number of countries a place where uh, policymakers recognize that science matters, recognize that viruses count, but at the same time, understand also that they need to take the decision for what's best for the, for the country. And I hope that uh, but this alliance of science and policymaking, reasonable policymaking, will help us grow out of the COVID be better than what we were before. Now, talking more about, about, uh, uh, about science and about sequencing, uh, as I, I started to say in my introduction, we've learned over the years. I remember when I was at WHO in my early earlier days in, uh, in the year 2006, it was a big crisis because of the fear of avian flu, which was H5N1. And suddenly a few countries, Indonesia in particular, were, was upset because uh, there were, had been a press release in, uh, in, uh, in Australia saying that the Australian government has bought enough vaccine to protect its whole population against pandemic flu Indonesia strain. And if the Indonesians said that, come on, what's that? You know, you will be immunizing your population and we, we will have nothing. And by that moment, the country stopped sharing sequences of influenza. So it took a long time. And one of the instruments that we had is called, uh, is called GISE. And GISE put together an agreement for data sequence sharing, which recognizes the, uh, the sovereignty of the person depositing the virus. So since then, uh, we have made progress, but initially it was only flu. And what we saw in Zika, Did she freeze? Um, okay, well, I in, in Ebola, likewise, very little sharing beyond the first of uh, the first sequences. And it took uh, again the system that he said had, had put in place with a data sharing agreement, so that now, a little bit more than a year into the pandemic, we have two million sequences of, of SARS CoV 2 which have been shared with the global community and help everybody. So I hope that rather than, than trying to destroy this system and replace it by something else, we all will strengthen what has worked and make it better for the next pandemic. Um, thank you. And, and I can't tell, there, there you are, you're, not, it's, you're freezing a little bit, but I get the question that I might add to this is from your perspective, also in, in terms of non-governmental organizations, um, are there any particular learning experiences in terms of how those interactions worked in the time of crisis, not when things are more quiet, whatever quiet means in this world, but rather in the moment of crisis, how do you think the, the various entities interact and is that sufficient or are there some learning experiences that we can use for the future? I think that what we see in this crisis is that there has been a lot of work from all the entities, the government, the pub, uh, private sector, NGOs, uh, scientists, everybody has tried to do their best. But what has lacked, I would say, is coordination. 
And, and why is that? Is that everybody was trying to do their best in their little corner. And unfortunately, uh, recently, it seems that the WHO has lost some of its power uh, to, to be the, the, the conductor of your orchestra and, and to, to come to and to, to bring people uh, moving forward together. So I hope that, you know, after the, the difficulties that WHO had with uh, the US administration, but not only, and uh, quite a lot of, of criticism for not uh, being absolutely on the top of science at the right moment, that also there will be an opportunity to, uh, to correct this uh, and that the organization, the World Health Organization will be better in a position to, uh, to conduct the orchestra for the next crisis. So because of that, a lot of non-governmental organization have, have come forward and have, uh, ha have put uh, initiative on the ground. Many of them successful, but sometimes not well articulated. So what I think should, we should do better is that we, we should have a, a better, a smoother coordination of the effort of, uh, of non-governmental actors. At DNDI, we have, uh, we have put together uh, with many other partners, a coalition and, and also a platform uh, for clinical trials in Africa to, to, uh, to test uh, drugs on non-hospitalized patients. But it has taken a long time and a long time to agree that, uh, that this was useful, to agree that the money was needed for that and to get this platform running. I think time is of the essence and initiative for non-government actor like an uh, initiative from, uh, from uh, scientists should find an easier way to get the resources to do what is needed at that moment. All right, thank you so much. Um, Christian, your thoughts and comments on the, this question? Well, I, I fully agree with what uh, Dr. Fergie and uh, Marie-Paul Kenny have said. Now, I, I just, maybe I want to emphasize a few points. First, uh, yeah, we were supposed to have plans, national plans, and unfortunately in some countries they have not been used. Uh, but what I really believe we, were, we have been lacking is an overall scenario, you see. Uh, what I found striking at the global level is a scenario where beyond the virus, beyond the medical, the scientific, the global health, one health, challenge, we would really embrace the overall consequence, the economic, psychological, all of them. So I really believe that we need, and it can only be done, we are the three of us repeating the same, it can only be done by coordination, but we really need to have scenario where depending on the virus, on the localization of the epidemic, we can really have a better preparation to what can be foreseen. Obviously, you are frequently wrong when you do this, but at least the fact that you think about it and that you prepare can be useful. The second point, and this has been uh, already mentioned in particular by Marie-Paul, we need to have on the one hand, a coordination because absolutely a lot of goodwill have led to many, many, to a dispersion, I would say, of many initiatives. At the other, uh, on the other hand, we really need to have a science-driven uh, nurturing, I would say, of the politics, of the politicians. So I really believe th this is absolutely not new, but the rapid exchange of information between scientists, all the network which have been shaped, not only obviously the global virus network, there are many networks, but for example, the global virus network is a network now of about 65 centers and 11 affiliates all over the world about research, education, expertise and advocacy. But the main point is that there is no issue on intellectual property, there are no, and, and it's a rapid exchange of knowledge. Now, such networks, they bring expertise. And then, yes, we have to coordinate. DNDI is a very good example. There are others. Where and a recent call, for example, from the National Science Foundation for networks of networks has been very interesting in this respect. So as to provide at the end of the day, something which is relevant, consistent 
to those who have to take the uh, decision. And I really believe that this has been very much lacking. Final uh, point on this, uh, diagnostics. Uh, we will, I'm sure that we are now going to discuss more the uh, uh, partnerships between academics and uh, industrial, they are keys. It has been, the production of vaccine has been a fantastic example of the value of having such partnerships. Uh, there are many, many things ongoing for treatments, but I really believe that on diagnostic, we have missed many opportunities that we have not really, I, I would say that I would have welcome and I still would welcome consortia on diagnostic similar to those which have been shaped for vaccines and also for treatments. There has been a huge progress in technology, huge. You have many companies which are very efficient, be large companies, be small companies, and we do not take enough advantage. And we are still left with an approach to diagnostics, which doesn't really uh, take advantage of this progress. So these are three points. Maybe we will come back later on education, obviously, which is key, and on this uh, public-private partnership. But these are three points which come to my mind. Um, great. And, and let me ask one question before we move to the next formal question, which is, uh, and you've touched on this, There, I spent five years developing a smallpox therapeutic um, which just was actually approved by the FDA, I guess about three or four weeks ago after 15, 20 years. Um, but as part of that, I, I read at some uh, certain simulations that were done, I think at Johns Hopkins, probably also 10 or 15 years ago or 20 years ago. Has there been any outreach to any of you yet by anybody to update, if you will, the simulations about what happens or is that something that is one of the learning experiences that has to come from this particular um, current pandemic? Maybe I can leave. Uh, yeah, please, leave Christian. Uh, yeah. Christian? Oh, okay. No, I thought I, I would uh, hand over to, to, to Marie Paul and uh, Dr. Fudd. Ah, no, on my, on my side, we, have, we, we are working. Uh, now, this is a very good point, Ken, that we. we we are actually working at the Global Virus Network in partnership with some institutions. It's a little bit early to exactly disclose all the mechanisms as to really work on these, on such, uh, I would say, scenario and simulations. Uh, we, and obviously what the John Hopkins have been doing has been really a great move. Uh, there are others. Again, when you do this, you are frequently wrong. We all know this, but the fact that you figure out the idea is by itself will not provide solution. There is not a one miracle solution. It's a combination of proposals which at the end of the day can lead us to be better. We have to be very humble. But this simulation can be, I believe, very, very helpful. Yeah, that's perfect. Uh, Bill or Marie Paul, do you want to comment on that or I can move on? I think you can move on, of course, just to say that there will be numerous lessons learned discussion about that. And we will have to see how these can these pieces can be put together, because at the end, we need to have one, you know, one uh, book about what we've learned and what we should do better mm -hmm. and not multiple competing uh, yeah. analysis. Yeah. From my point of view, can we go ahead? Okay. I don't have anything to offer. That's great. And you and you really mentioned before, we had wargamed out a lot and then people decided to ignore the wargaming. And I think that's really the point that everybody's making. They may not have been perfect, but they did exist. Um, so the next question really uh, delves into this a little more and it relates to taking this gap analysis and, and going further, which is beyond what went well or did not go well, are there specific organizations that from your perspective, should be strengthened in their ability to monitor and or respond to these infectious crises? And is, as a corollary, are there any organizations that should be abandoned or abolished? I know that's difficult to say publicly, but it might be something that needs to be discussed. Um, what should be kept, what should be changed? And finally, 
are there any new organizations, networks, entities that you think are necessary to better prepare for the future, either governmental or non-governmental? Bill, would you uh, like to take a shot at this question? Yes, uh, thank you, Ken. Um, the first 40 years after the Second World War, most of us in global health relied heavily on the multilateral organizations, WHO, UNICEF, UNDP, World Bank, and the bilateral organizations. And then quietly, uh, something else developed, which are hybrid organizations. And I should say from the beginning that I have uh, two different views. I like the idea of lots of different organizations because people have a specific interest and they'll get into things. But I agree with the others we need coordination. There has to be somebody at the top that coordinates all this. So these hybrid organizations were very interesting. Gavi is one of them, where it has forced WHO and UNICEF to work together in a way that they didn't necessarily want to. I mean, uh, the younger people won't understand the big split where uh, UNICEF was trying to do specific things. Uh, and so they were doing vertical programs and WHO wanted to do horizontal things and they were having trouble getting together on that. Well, Gavi forces them to work together, but in addition, Gavi now brings in corporations and foundations and all kinds of groups. And so they've become the leader in providing vaccines for, for uh, children. But Mechtazan is another example of that that uh, Mechtazan does not answer to any of the multilateral or bilateral organizations. It, it really answers to a Mechtazan expert committee. But it became so important and so useful that WHO and the World Bank both asked if they could join after the fact. They saw this was working and they asked if they could uh, join after the fact. So we've seen the same hybrid organizations for HIV for uh, tuberculosis and so forth. And what they do is they utilize the multilaterals and the bilaterals, but they're not captured by any of them. And it's, so it's turned out to be an interesting thing. And with the coronavirus, I think COVAX will be in that position. Uh, they are able to, as a hybrid organization, include everyone and provide uh, leadership for the world. Um, Chris, Marie Paul, you're you're back. Did you? Um, yes, you, I'm you, back. Apologies, uh, I don't know. Uh, why I'm... Uh, did you hear the question before the? Uh... Yes, absolutely. An unstable network. Apologies. So you know, I, I, for me, I, I think that something should be done in order to to restore the credibility and the role of of uh, of WHO as the as the main convener uh, in, in crisis and for health. So I heard also Bill Fee talk about COVAX, and I think indeed COVAX is, is, has done a lot and needs to, you know, they will need to have quite a number of lessons learned about how, how COVAX has, what COVAX has done the best, what can be improved. But I think at the end of the day, uh, multilateralism where everybody has, uh, all countries have a, have a say and have a seat at the table is, uh, is invaluable. So I think that uh, that we should try as much as possible as a global community to restore the prestige and the voice of WHO after this crisis is finished, but also to make sure that you know that the WHO system allows uh, others to participate and that is not a, a, clo a closed system. So um, we 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 have a tendency in global health in adding new institutions and we create new institutions without giving them a time mandate. And at the end, we, 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 we finish having a very crowded environment of an organization here, another one there. And, and at the end, it's difficult to see the logic and, and the harmonization of all that. So I would, I would suggest if there is an appetite to create new organizations after this, this crisis, and I know that there are already discussion about uh, continuation of Act A, which is the parent of COVAX, if I may say, 
we need to see whether we, we give this new organization an unlimited mandate or whether they say, you know, we establish this for five years, for 10 years, and then we see whether this is still what we want to have or whether we need something else. Because otherwise, what, what I, I've seen in, in, uh, in, the exp in my, my time in, in global health is a piling up of different organization uh, without any ever disappearing. And I think we, we should think more uh, strategically when we, when we talk about new organization, new entities, about whether the same will be needed in the future or whether it's only a temporary need. Mm -hmm. Christian, your thoughts? Yeah, I, I fully agree with what both um, Dr. Fudge and Marie-Paul Kenny have said. I mean, we have to be very clear. I, I really uh, fully agree with what Marie Paul said regarding the piling of uh, new organizations and so on. That's, uh, that, does, that will lead to nowhere. Now, I also very much agree with what uh, Dr. Fudger has described, what he called the hybrid organizations. And I believe that the three of us would really figure out uh, a powerful WHO, but we have to see how this can be, which exactly can be really get input from different sources and really make a sense of an overall a number of uh, a number of overall very large bulk of information and then also can delegate some activities um, so th that will be a key point because this is so easy to tell but we know what it means when you just see what's going on now with the so-called Delta variant, for example, in Europe, everybody starts again uh, to go um, in uh, its own direction. And, and the same happens worldwide. So we really need countries to accept that a part of the national interest is really uh, in, a, in a way incorporated in what WHO is doing. And so, but, but this is feasible and we have to do it. That's the only point which is positive or maybe one of the only uh, handful of positive points with COVID-19. Everybody agrees that we cannot do have this to the same extent uh, in, the, in the near future, you see. And we also know that we will have other pandemics. So we have, we have to move. And I really hope that this will be done. Final point, this has to include industry. Obviously, there are many contacts between WHO and many organizations with industry, and this is very good. But for me, the point is to have industrial partners being part of the strategy, not only being part of, I have something to sell, uh, I have something to discuss on a case by case, but really having sharing the strategy working together. And there are very good examples. There are very good examples of this. At the GVN, but there are many other examples, but at the GVN, we have what we call the Corporate Partnership Program. And again, the NDI is very much working along those lines and many other institutions. So, uh, but that's a key point. And uh, um, we, we will see, we will see whether our countries will accept to have a strong WHO, and uh, but that would be a key discussion. Um, thank you. I should add that uh, Elliot Levy, who's not with us today, um, one of the one of the many um, values he was going to bring to this particular discussion is that he is working to help form a group that will focus on um, raising funds from the pharmaceutical industry to develop a number of antivirals that can be brought through to phase one or so and then be kind of off the shelf or structurally useful for a variety of different things going forward. So it was really to create an industry-based um, mm -hmm. organization. There are a number of initiatives like this, but he and he represented one of them, but, but uh, because he's not here to have the industry voice that we'd hope to have, I think it's, it's important to mention. Uh, let me ask another question on, on this. You may not want... Could start. I just add something to... Uh, I agree. So I think we all agree that uh, WHO should be strengthened because if we didn't have WHO, we'd have to create it. So it's important to make it as good and strong as we can possibly make it. And 
I think that the U.S. was part of the problem when it started by insisting on certain things. They wanted strong regional offices in order to protect Tahoe. And they did that, but the regional offices became strong enough. And I've worked with WHO in a regional office. They became strong enough that they could undermine Geneva when they wanted to. And it seemed like they often wanted to. So that's a problem. Uh, we created WHO basically with a board of 195 ministers of health, but no CEO would agree to take over a company if they had a board of 195 people, it's just unwieldy. And then uh, the United States with other countries every year tried to reduce their budget. And you can't keep doing that and have the strength that WHO need to truly be able to lead some of these efforts. Merck actually went to WHO for, with the Mechtazan uh, proposal and they had to leave because the bureaucracy was so great, WHO could not come up with a way to work with a private company and so forth. So we need to improve WHO, but the way we could do it is to now say, okay, we've had over 70 years of experience. Let's look back and ask, how do we wish we had been organized? And then see what do we have to change in order to make it the kind of organization that we all uh, trust and are willing to follow. Uh, thank you. Thank you for that, Bill. In fact, you, you touched on a question I wanted to ask without necessarily asking you to name names. Have you seen entities that or structures that have been, besides certain governmental issues we've talked about, that have been overt roadblocks that might be best if they were not part of the future discussions about pandemics? And again, you may not want to mention a name in a public forum, but but at least an awareness issue would be useful. Well, the, see, I'm old enough, I don't have to protect my career. And so uh, I think it's a mistake for health programs from USAID to be in our State Department. It means that there are political considerations for any decision that they make on global health. And for me, it would be much better to have global health programs from the US government come under the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Then you have one person that is making decisions domestically and globally. So other countries have that problem, but some of them have solved it. I mean, I think, uh, the, I think Sweden has done a remarkable job of what they've been able to do in keeping politics out of those decisions. Um, Christian and Marie Paul, um, comments? Marie Paul, do you want to comment? Yeah, well, of course, and I, I do agree with, uh, with what Bill just said. Unfortunately, uh, health is politics. And, uh, and then many countries, because of that, try to use, or they don't try, they do use their, their support to, uh, to uh, development and to health development. Uh, as part of their, um, how they say, their uh, foreign diplomacy uh, um, armonatorium. And, and, and therefore we see, we see uh, uh, rules which have been put in place, which is at, uh, at the detriment of, of health development. Uh, DNDI, like many other organizations, have had to see how they can navigate to avoid being under uh, under punitive uh, uh, regime by the U.S. administration because uh, because they didn't uh, you know because some of aspect of the program could not uh, could not guarantee that there was nothing against ever about abortion or other. And it's not that the NDI was working on abortion program, but also when you believe that the right to abortion is a is a public is is a private is a human right, then you it's difficult also to uh, to have to swear that you will never never do anything in this direction just to get the U.S. money. So so the the use of uh, of health development of subsidies by USAID. In uh, as a political tool is indeed something that many countries uh, should try to see that they could avoid because it's not only the U.S. of course who's using their their public money 
uh, as as a as a tool for for diplomacy. Yeah, uh, and can if I may follow up on this, please. Uh, Yes, it's it's very important. I mean, because there is a there is a contradiction. I mean, between having national health issues in the context of uh, these global views on the way to organize a strategy, and actually it goes beyond because it's quite frequently also involving the agriculture departments or ministries. I mean, because as this has been done. Uh, uh, we had been reminded of this before. It's always or mostly about zoonosis and it's the interface between animals and humans. And it's very uh, interesting and actually frightening in a way to see the fight uh, between uh, ministries of uh, health uh, with ministries of agriculture or equivalent depending on the countries so really, this is again and again where you need to find a way to have a kind of upper level. But as soon as you say something which are, is at the upper level, you must be afraid of bureaucracy. And so that's really the difficulty we have to solve. Uh, and I, exactly as Dr. Fudge says, I like the comment, your comment on the being the CEO of a company with uh, 140 uh, uh, guys uh, trying to discuss. And that, in a way, also the problem to a lesser extent of the uh, European Union, you see. So we really have to find mechanisms where we nurture with science-driven information uh, organization, uh, which then really can take the decision not on a national base, health uh, uh, dependent, I would say, uh, challenges and political challenges. And that also involves agriculture. Yeah. Just having 140 people on any board gives me shivers. <laughs> yes. um, so um, moving to a slightly different topic, previous panels have discussed the trade-offs between economic impact and the investment in medical countermeasures. And we touched on this just briefly. So taking a um, a very granular view of recent learning experiences. Do you have a sense, and, and what sense do you have, uh, of the willingness of leaders at, at all economic levels and in various countries to look past the short-term economic needs to appropriately prepare for the future pandemics? Or are we fundamentally limited by economics and politics to repeat these past mistakes? And Christian, would you like to start with this? Well, it's a, it's a very important, but a very, very difficult question. I'm, a, I'm an optimistic person, so I, I will take the optimistic view. I would say before COVID-19, no chance. Uh, after COVID-19, I really hope we will see uh, that many heads of government, but beyond this, I mean, in large international organizations, they really got the point. I mean, we cannot afford for such a huge, huge economic impact. So I, I really believe that now there is a sense that investing uh, will, be, uh, will pay off. You see, what, what the WHO has mentioned, I mean, we need, I believe, uh, 11 billions of doses uh, to vaccinate 70% of the world population. Uh, we need billions and billions to have the new antivirals and the, I mentioned the diagnostics and so on. Not a single country is going to afford for this, but having said that, it means that you have again and again to have, if we are speaking of WHO, an organization which is able not only to speak of health, but also to really work with the countries on what it means from the economic investments which need to be done. But yes, I would say that uh, that might be feasible. All right, Marie Paul. I think it's it's a really important question. And I, I you know, I've been struggling also with understanding uh, how to help uh, governments in Europe in particular understand that research is an investment that developing you know, tools, vaccine drugs, 
even against diseases which are not prevalent in Europe, is an investment because it's building science, it's building knowledge, it's building industry. And, and unfortunately, too many countries in Europe in particular, on the contrary of what we see in the US, are seeing this as a cost. So, and, and this is for research, research on health. I'm not sure that it's the case on other types of research and maybe, uh, maybe uh, governments think that investing, I don't know, in, in the 5G or in, in communication, telecommunication is an investment. But clearly, they see research on health as a cost and not an investment. So the big challenge would be to change this mentality and, and to, to, uh, to also highlight the potential that such investment may have in, in, in case of a pandemic, of course, but not only that it also ha have, has on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of stimulating innovation on giving employment to young people and so on and so forth. So we have a chance uh, in Europe uh, with the establishment of the new initiative called HERA. So what it has, it has a name. The shape is still unsure. But this is an initiative which intends to emulate a BADA in, in, in the US. But I'm already a bit worried to hear that, you know, that uh, government in Europe would like actually that the cost of HERA is not, is not uh, uh, um, actually borne by themselves, but it's borne by industry. And they talk about a public-private organization. And I keep repeating, but BADA is not a public-private initiative. BADA is a public... Uh, initiative depending on money from the government. Of course, it works with the industry. And I hope that when we build HERA in Europe, we will build something similar, which has public money to spend with a public governance, but which is able to work with the industry to develop what we need. Right, very helpful. Um, Bill, thoughts? Uh, I like what I've heard. This is an optimistic uh, panel. And after each of the uh, new diseases that we've seen, I have expected that governments would provide uh, money for infrastructure and public health, because that's the lesson each time infrastructure is inadequate. And it's never happened, because as soon as the disease problem goes down, the funding goes down. But I agree with Christian that this may be a different time. COVID-19 may be the change in, in thinking with this. The historian Will Durant said, we'll never get the, the world to collectively do something unless they fear an alien invasion. Mm -hmm. And as I lectured the other day to a group of students, I said, we're in the middle of an alien invasion and we have to see it that way. And it, it, it's a surrogate for a true alien invasion, but it's enough of a circuit that we could figure out how to organize for it. I think 1796 with Jenner vaccinating the James Phipps was the beginning of modern public health. I think 2021 could be the takeoff point for true global public health, where we figure out how to bring the resources of the whole globe together in order to protect everyone. And I suggested uh, last week, we should as a globe say, we're going to vaccinate 1 billion people in a hundred days, and then we're gonna speed up. I mean, that's what it takes is that kind of, of positive leadership. And it, as people have mentioned it, that requires coordination. So you have a coalition so that people are not working against each other, that they're not interested in turf. They all agree to the outcome that we're looking for. I love the positive nature. I will read one question slash comment that came in uh, from one of the uh, attendees and I'll just quote it. I think we may be missing a sociological point of view. The failures of, with COVID resulted from faults of human nature. Arrogance was mentioned. How can we express, expect such faults of human nature to be different when mankind will face the next crisis. That's so. a very interesting comment. And uh, 
Well, but I, I think that this is what uh, Bill has said. Uh, it doesn't come spontaneously. It could come just because we are forced to have this. So that's the way, the, the optimistic way is not to believe that uh, the human nature will become very good suddenly, but that we have no other option and that progressively uh, we, uh, we, we come slowly to understand this. That's, that's really the, uh, the only way. But I, I, I would like maybe to take also this opportunity, maybe you wanted to, to touch on it, Ken, afterward, but um, education and, and training is really a key point in this. Obviously that cannot be immediate, but you see also in my previous positions at, uh, in CERM, uh, which stand for the French NIH and then at the Institut Pasteur, I have really found very striking the fact that uh, we have been, uh, we are lacking uh, virologists all over the world, all over the world. I see the same at the University of South Florida and all countries. And we know why, because, for, uh, because virology and the risk of viruses have been underappreciated and that has been the consequence. And I really believe that the challenge will be to provide uh, to the world the next generation of virologists, which should be really uh, transdisciplinary, which is a very a word very easy to tell, very fashionable, very hard to achieve, where you really have public health, global public health, science, medicine, entrepreneurship with industrial partners. And there are a number of institutions we, which are doing great things on this, uh, many of them. And again, we have to coordinate, uh, but we have to reinforce the effort because it's not enough. At the Global Virus Network, we have what we call the GVN Academy. Many other institutions have excellent programs. We need to reinforce. Otherwise, all what we are discussing uh, will actually be uh, meaningless in a few years. You know, I, um, since Bill has thrown in a couple of quotes, I might modify a quote by Schiller. Um, the quote actually starts with against stupidity, but maybe it should be against a lack of education, the gods themselves contend in vain. Um, that, that, yeah. So <laughs> Bill, I, we can all throw quotes, <laughs> but I think that that's an important aspect of it all. If we don't have an educated populace to realize that this will happen again and to understand that we need to set up the systems and procedures, um, then we are uh, doomed to repeat these errors. Um, so we if, I may, if I may just add we, on that, actually, I agree that, you know, we are lacking virologists because it doesn't seem for, for the young one, it didn't seem, you know, that how they say attractive as a, as, a, as a profession because there's so much which is high tech and all this old virology what is this but we are also lacking um, people trained people in all areas of health see also the crisis that there is because too many uh, too many patients on COVID came to emergency rooms there was not enough oxygen that's for sure but also even if there were beds of for uh, medical care there was you know in many places there was nobody to operate this beds. So we have also been, been trying collectively in many countries to avoid training people in medicine, in research on medicine, because again, this was seen as a cost and not as an investment. As a result, we have fragilized the health system which worked previously, and we have done nothing in terms of, of strengthening the ones that needed the reinforcing. And therefore, we, we, we find ourselves in a dear situation where we don't have trained scientists and we don't have trained physician nurses and, and, uh, and community workers to take care of those who need them. Yeah, yeah well, it's a, it's a really important point. I suspect that with the amount of uh, focus that will change, but those changes themselves in terms of educating the next generation of um, has a time component to it. Uh, and time is, a, is our enemy here. Um, we're getting closer and closer to the end. I just had one other um, question to, to, to pose to you very quickly. Uh, at least in the United States, a lot was made of the fact that certain um, governments, when they were offered the COVID-19 vaccines, and we'll put price aside for a second, were unwilling to indemnify the manufacturers. Did you, from your respective uh, position, see that as an issue or still see that as an issue in the future? 
Um, is that something that is a, 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 a clear need or, or not? Well, this is something, if I may start, that I worked a lot when I was on when I was in WHO because we discussed how we could help, you know, deploy uh, vaccines. This was after the uh, the Ebola pandemic. Deployed vaccine or drugs which were not completely tested and which were not registered, and there was an agreement that if we wanted, if 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 um, uh, the governments wanted to deploy such vaccine, they needed to take responsibility for, in case of liability for uh, adverse events that could not, you know, have been, uh, have been planned. But also there was a recognition that there were a number of, of items on which actually the manufacturers should keep the liability if they are not producing the vaccine, the drugs whatsoever, in, in accordance with good manufacturing practices or not in agreement with their own specifications, then they should be held liable because of that, because it's their job to do this part properly. But of course, they could not be held responsible for un, uh, unexpected uh, severe adverse events. So the WHO worked at that time to put in place an insurance that would help uh, take care of this liability for low-income countries. But at the same time, there was also a recognition, and I know that this is not the case in the US, where you have this insurance for all cases of whatever happens with the vaccine, which is not existing elsewhere. But I still think also that it is fair to ask uh, the, the industry to take responsibility for adverse events why, when after a product has been license has been registered after there is full knowledge of what are the side effects whatsoever, then I don't think that it is reasonable and fair to ask the public sector to take responsibility for all liability. Because at the end, it's, it's also a business to do vaccine and a business comes with risk. And I, I still think that uh, when a drug, a vaccine has been fully tested, is on the market, it is the responsibility and the potential liability should lie with the producer. It will be an interesting question. Um, in many years ago, it was not, um, the, um, the vaccines were not being developed for the reasons of liability. So we've gone through that. Um, as we come up to the end of the seminar and the webinar, and this has been fabulous, I think it's time to put up the results of the poll, if we can, from the, from the tech team. Um, and, um, and as you can see in that, um, about approximately a little more than half of the uh, attendees thought improved international su surveillance reporting and response mechanisms, 55% believe that. Uh, and then about equally split um, uh, between enhanced coordination between governments and private industry and increased education and funding at the local and national level. So, obviously all topics that we talked about, but coordination, surveillance, um, reporting and response mechanisms uh, being uh, more dominant, if you will. Um, so thank you all for responding to that. And thank you to the audience and to our stellar lineup of panelists uh, for taking the time during their busy schedules to, to share their extraordinary insights um, really, I personally enjoyed this and I thank you for your comments and, and your, 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 your wisdom. Um, this and the other Galleon Foundation webinars have been recorded and are viewable on the Galleon Foundation's homepage. I would encourage you, to, you, the audience, to stay tuned for future webinars. We certainly look forward to your continued engagement and uh, really appreciate the time that you have spent with us today. So with that, um, I wish you all a fabulous day and I wish that I hope that these learning experiences and discussions can be uh, can be made reality as quickly as possible. So thank you all. And we thank, thank the Gallian Foundation. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.